of other things during this call. Uh, but Dennis, why don't you why don't you go ahead and start, and uh, we'll we'll get to those things as we get closer. Okay, I've got yeah, right. I've got those slides in there, so we'll 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 slide into that here just a second. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to 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 uh, once a year get my opportunity, my my chance, the one time they let me have a chance to to speak here. So um, there's. And I enjoy the spring because there's lots of different things that we can talk about. Plenty of things to talk about today. The one thing we, we usually are talking about in the spring is flooding. Really not a whole lot to talk about that today. We'll address that as we go along. So uh, again, always want to thank our, our partners for creating, helping us put the pieces together uh, for this. Always a lot of fun hearing what people have to say, the different things going on, different impacts related to that. Uh, Dr. Aaron Wilson from the Ohio State Climate Office, Ohio State Extension. And Bird Polar Center will be following me up uh, this uh, in, in May. Uh, so we'll get another good shot to hear from the eastern part of our region. Okay, briefly, um, a couple things. Doug, do you want to mention the survey or do you want to talk about this? Uh, let's talk about this very quickly. So uh, one of the things we're doing, this is about our 10th year anniversary of doing, believe it or not, of doing these types of webinars. I, I, it'd be interesting to hear how many people have been around for 10 years on these. I know I have, but it would be sort of interesting to hear from you all um, if, if you have been. So anyway, congratulations to the, uh, to the decade, uh, the, the, the decadal people, we'll call you. Um, here's the sort of, we, we put, together this, put together this flyer, which is pretty much by the numbers of when we started in 2011 and why we did. There were some extreme events along the way, as you can see there. On those various years, uh, extreme event, extreme climate events that uh, actually perked a lot of interest, uh, and on, for this webinar, among other things, um, I'm not sure what I want to highlight here, other than a lot of people have more and more people are tuning into these, which is fantastic, and you can see the spread, if you will, of the types of people that are on these. Uh, that that's always interesting for us as well to see who gets on these and who cares. Um, the other thing is we have a uh, we'll encourage you to fill out a survey if you um, if you're new to this like you just signed up since January you've never been on uh, you may receive in the next oh I'd say by the end of today a survey link for you old timers those of you who are signed up long before this year uh, hopefully you've already gotten that link I think a reminder was sent out earlier today as well or yesterday whatever. Um, but uh, feel free to take it, and uh, we're trying to you, we're trying to sort of analyze and evaluate our, our 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 current status and where we go from here and all that business. So any any input you can give us is fantastic. You know, basically, it's why why are you listening to us? <laughs> and uh, we're, we're interested in that. Um, we we, Dennis, have, we have no idea. Yeah. We have no idea why you are listening to us. Please tell us. <laughs> Now we hope we know, but you know. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to say was we do, and I should have mentioned this at the top, is that we have a question and answer session that'll follow this. So if you have questions that come to you during the uh, during the uh, presentation, type them in the question boxes, the the question interface on your on the webinar, and we'll get to those hopefully at the end, as many as we can. Uh, we always appreciate those. Anything else, Dennis? Before you uh, really start. No, um, we've included the web link here at the bottom if you wanted to see this two-pager. Again, this, this two-pager is, is the first part of this, kind of a by the numbers, kind of reviewing our 10 years of what's happened, some of the numbers, how many contributors, how many people have attended, that sort of thing. And then once uh, you folks, please do fill out the survey. Once we get that those numbers back, we'll, you'll be hearing more about this. As again, we've been doing this almost 10 years, end of the year will be 10 years, and we wanted to kind of do a review of, of what's gone over that time period. So, okay, let's roll on from here. Okay, um, you know, uh, standard review current conditions, various impacts, and then go on to outlooks. Um, I left this in just because it was a picture I took a year, exactly a year ago of you know, what it looked like outside, and we're much greener and much less white than we had at this point last year. So diving into review of current conditions, a picture from uh, the Minnesota Incident Command 
on the ox cart fire in northwest Minnesota. We'll mention about that a little bit later on in some of the fire discussions. Okay, first off, uh, review of March temperature. Again, largely warmer overall in our region, um, a little bit less to the south, quite warm to our north, North Dakota coming in there. You're gonna hear North Dakota a lot this time because of, of probably the most extreme events uh, centered on North Dakota right now, but lots of top 10 warmest. From a precipitation standpoint, you're gonna hear this one too, a tale of two uh, entities or two locations. When we had our meeting yesterday with the regional folks, this came up frequently again. Southern areas, you can see this again in March, storm track from the plains, um, uh, Nebraska coming in 126 of 127 years, second wettest March on record. Um, Kansas not far behind, over to the Ohio Valley. To the north, relatively dry, low numbers. Montana and North Dakota are the winners, or losers as the case may be, at the second driest overall on record. Michigan, you know, not as bad, but number 38 there. All, and, you know, really clearly a marked difference between where those these two were. Um, okay, then let's go to, come on, here we go. Uh, just a few of the precip details for March uh, from the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Wettest March on record for stations Casper, Goodland, and Grand Island, Nebraska. Driest March on record for Dickinson, North Dakota. Bismarck, number three, Mobridge, fourth. And then the snowiest March on record for Casper, Wyoming, and, and Denver. Uh, we had that big snowstorm back in, in the latter part of March that, that really helped put that together. Uh, a little bit longer, we won't belabor these too much, but we need to put some context on things here. If we go January through March, uh, again, the north is the warmest over this time period. This does include that very cold period in February and really impacted areas to the south, most impact to the south. You know, it did cool things down a little bit in the north, but not nearly as bad overall. January through March, precipitation, again, similar pattern to what we saw before. Wetter to the south, uh, Nebraska still at number two, uh, North Dakota at number one and driest. And now Michigan goes to the 12th driest and Montana at the 13th driest. Uh, and then one more step backward because you see North Dakota sticking out again in this whole situation. October through March, North Dakota again the driest on record. Northern areas dry overall, but near, nearly as bad as North Dakota was and wetter to the south once again. And when you combine that wetness with the warmth, uh, in this case, uh, North Dakota being the hundred, the be uh, number five, fifth, fifth warmest over that same time period. You combine the dryness with the warmth and that puts them in the situation they're in. They're in some cases a little bit lucky in that this dry period occurred over the winter time, which is their drier period on record uh, or climatologically, if it happened during the summertime would have been even worse. Jumping ahead to just the last 30 days to capture, catch us up on a little bit more current conditions here precipitation in the upper left-hand side, that north central area continues dry. Nebraska to Missouri, Iowa has been wetter, um, but overall, you know, the purple area is 150 to 200% of average with some pockets of dry out east and then very dry up in the, the northern plains. Temperature-wise, overall, very warm compared to average. Uh, the, the focus of the warmest now is more over, over Wisconsin, UP of Michigan, parts of Michigan, um, still uh, warmer than average over the whole region. Uh, the only places a little bit cooler than average are out in the plains, the, the far western plains, um, largely because of the, the snowfall they had in that area and some cooler temperatures sitting out in that region. Okay. So that kind of gives you a recap of the situation where we've been right now. Um, so let's um, let's go ahead and look at some of the the focus areas of some of the some of the issues we're dealing with. Uh, let's jump to from some water issues, looking at uh, too much and too little water in some cases. Okay. When we're dealing with soil moisture, again, we've talked about this several times. We, we have the conceptual idea of what soil moisture should be. 
Um, but when we have various products, they don't always agree in, in determining what soil moisture looks like. I threw a couple of them out there just, just for comparison. And again, we're looking for commonalities or, or, or when we're looking at different soil moisture models. The one on the upper left-hand side is, is a new one that has just come out, uh, collaborative effort, USDA, George Mason, and I can't remember who else is involved in that. I apologize. The areas in blue are somewhat wetter the areas in brown that are drier. Um, so far, this one seems to react more quickly to wet and dry condition. It wets up very quickly and dries out very quickly. Uh, so you can see some areas that have been wetter with some of the recent precipitation, North Dakota, and then some of those eastern corn belt valleys running some, somewhat drier. The, uh, the, the uh, graphic from uh, NASA in the lower right-hand side uh, has similar patterns, uh, you know, same sorts of things, not quite as wet in some of the areas. And then the lower left-hand side is the, you know, we've, we're two weeks into the USDA NAS crop reports. And the numbers are unfortunately are pretty sobering in some of those areas. Uh, North Dakota actually has improved from last week, but the beginning of the week, they were 83% short to very short in the way of soil moisture. There was some of that rain that did come through that area helped out part of the state and they've had a little bit of snow. But still quite dry overall. Much of the many of the western states all in that same situation. Eastern states a little bit of dryness, but not too bad at this point. Uh, combining with that, looking at overall hydrologic situation, uh, where we are in the way of stream flow. Again, the same kind of pattern. Greens are near average for this time of year. Anything that's up in the blues to to black is is uh, such a you know is above average. Anything yellow to brown is below. So really no surprises in the areas that you're seeing here. The areas that have had some rainfall, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, over to Illinois are running a bit higher. Um, those areas in the Eastern Corn Belt, especially up in the, in, uh, into Michigan, Lower Peninsula of Michigan, uh, running quite dry overall, haven't had as much precipitation. North Dakota running drier. Uh, as we look out in the plains, not a kind of a mixed message. Uh, there is a mixed signal as you get out near the mountains because we'll talk about this more in a minute. Uh, so we've had some early melt off of some of the snow out there. So it's kind of masking some of the overall issues that we're seeing uh, because we're getting early melt out of, of that snowfall. So talking about snow now, I'm going to kind of have to have to point you to a couple of things here of, of again, a tale of, of different locations. Most of what we're being concerned about here is the eastern slopes, the Rockies. So the areas that are in green from central Montana, parts of Wyoming and into the Platte River in northeast Colorado um, had, you know, especially Wyoming and Colorado had some late snows and they're going to, going to get a bit more in the next couple of days out there, which will help out their situations, helped out their, their the front range snowpack uh, so that the snowfall and water equivalent coming out of that is not too bad. The greens here are indicating uh, anywhere from 90 to 109 percent of average, so close to average. Uh, you see lots of yellows in Wyoming and Colorado. Uh, most of those are on the other side of the Continental Divide, indicating that they didn't get as much snowfall. In fact, we'll talk more about Colorado here in just a bit. Uh, parts of eastern Wyoming, we've probably had melt off in those situations why they are so low at, at this point. But so the, the green areas there, not too bad overall in the way of snowpack and runoff. Western slopes, not very good at this point. So kind of summarizing some of the water issues, that March snow really helped the, the eastern slopes of Colorado from a water supply standpoint, also parts of Wyoming. Um, the western slope from, from, um, uh, from, from Becky at the Colorado State Climate Office, indicating that uh, they had much more limited snow, early melt off of that snow, which is going to lead to water supply issues, potential fires, and some possible reduce, reductions in production because of some of the um, some of the, the production areas, there are some specialty crops, fruits that are grown in some of the Western Colorado areas because of this limited snow, uh, snow. Side note, we've been hearing about this in the Southwestern US already, some of those problems. Uh, Montana's also had an early melt out of snow. They had less help up there from that March snow event. So the overall snowpack wasn't too bad, but the warmth is helping to melt it down pretty early. If we put this into what's happening uh, in the way graphics from the Army Corps of Engineers, 
First, we're looking at the, the Missouri River here above Fort Peck on the left-hand side and Fort Peck to Garris on the right-hand side. Uh, what you're looking at here is the blue, where the blue is, and comparing that to average, which is the red line in both of these locations. So not too bad, but still below average in both of these areas this year. And especially Fort Peck has started to drop off. Fort Peck to Garrison has dropped off a little bit, but had a bit of a hold on it there. So not as bad as some years, but still not, uh, you know, not, not great overall, let's put it that way. If we look at the, the North Platte on the left and the South Platte on the right, again, they had that, the, the, end of, the end of March snowfall that put a little bit more on, but they have now started to drop off in both of those basins. Uh, if you remember, those were showing up as green, as not, uh, not too far off average, but a little bit below average overall. We'll jump over to the Great Lakes uh, now and talk about a, the, the, the Great Lakes area a little bit. Uh, from the, the, um, from GLARIL, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory on looking at sea surf, or excuse me, uh, lake surface temperatures. Uh, the green areas along some of the southern lakes are getting closer to 50 degrees in some of those areas, and then uh, large parts of the lake still, you know, well in the 40s that they, they tend to stay colder, colder with the larger and further north lakes. Uh, there is at this point still a 0.3% ice coverage. Um, at this point, uh, the warmer temperatures and, and the ice coverage wasn't that outstanding this year anyway, so a tiny bit of ice coverage left, but almost completely gone at this point. Uh, lake levels, where we're jumping to now in the way of Corps of Engineers, uh, the graphics here, Lake Superior, upper left, Michigan, Huron, upper right, St. Clair, lower left, Erie on the lower right. And uh, just to, from perspective here, the, the, the dots at the top are the record highs, the dots at the bottom of each of the graphics are the record lows, and then the ones, the dots, the darker dots in the middle are the averages. So if you've been part of our conversations recently, been lots of discussions about high lake levels, uh, you, you're looking at the, the solid line here, comparing where the solid line is. So that we have fallen away from, in, in all of our lakes, away from the record highs, still somewhat above average, um, but have fallen away from some of the extreme highs that we saw before. And then the plume that you see around this on the lower, on the right-hand side is where we're, the, the, the range of solutions of where we could see going on. So we could return to record levels, but that would be on the extreme high part. Uh, and in most of our cases, we see, uh, you know, a, a, a moderate, uh, more moderate one, still above average, staying above average, but a more moderate solution in each of these situations. And then a graphic, I, I apologize, I uh, couldn't quite get this one to line up quite right. Uh, looking at what's happening in the way of, of river flooding, uh, I showed you what was happening in the stream flows and that most of the places we were dealing with moderate stream flows or, or low stream flows. Uh, looking ahead at what our risk is for potential flooding, uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've often, we're often talking about flooding at this time of year. Well, really not much this year. We've had some minor flooding in some places. There's a bit on the Mississippi right now, given some of the recent rainfalls. Um, this graphic indicates where uh, there is potential for flooding looking ahead this year. The reds are a moderate risk of moderate flood risk. Uh, the oranges, excuse me, the oranges are moderate. Excuse me, the reds, the reds are moderate. Uh, the oranges are, are minor flood risk. And then the greens really no expanded flood risk. And the areas we're looking at are, are more eastern Kansas, parts of Missouri, and parts of Illinois, uh, where we have uh, potential problems with convective, heavier rainfalls leading to, to, to some flooding in those areas. We don't have any too many background issues we're, we're looking at as concern, concerns for extreme river flooding looking ahead right now. Okay. Jumping ahead now to the dry side of the house, what's going on or in the way of lack of precipitation. No surprises here. The U.S. Drought Monitor just released this morning and what's happening across the region. Okay, reminder, white areas are, are drought free. Yellows are, are abnormally dry and it's still not considered drought. And then the you go from various levels D1 up to D3 and D4. Much of the eastern, well, that's, let's start with that southern area. The southern area we talked about has been wetter, really no problems in those areas, and really not too much in the extreme wetness we've talked about. As you get up, um, you know, 
you know, from Northern Iowa over to Southern Michigan, Northern Ohio, um, they are quite dry uh, and some D1 areas. Right now, no major concerns in most of these areas, but recognition that we are fairly dry. Uh, dryness this time of year, especially on the agricultural side, is, is not a major issue unless it's of extreme dryness. Uh, a bit more problem in northwest Iowa, and then you get out of the plains and you see a much wider range of issues. That area focused on, on North Dakota is no surprise, where we have up to D3 exceptional drought. And then you go into Colorado, lots of D3 and up to D4 on the western part of the state. Uh, but in the Missouri River Basin, uh, mostly I don't think we have any, any D4 in the Missouri River side. Uh, but lots of D2, D3 in that, in that region. Now, there has been some improvement in that this week. And the graphic on the lower right-hand side, the areas of green showed improvement because of that rainfall that we did have up into Minnesota and Wisconsin, parts of the, uh, you know, the Eastern Dakotas and far Southeast North Dakota. So tease them a little bit to give them a little bit of precipitation and improve those areas. But the Western, the, the Western parts up in the far North Dakota area, uh, really not much improvement, even though there was a little bit of precipitation up there. In fact, we're reaching a point of concern, really, really serious concern up there because uh, climatologically peak precipitation occurs um, second to third week of, of May on average. So we're nearing uh, that time for, for, for improvement, the ability for much improvement to occur. And in the outlooks we're gonna show you here, we're not seeing much chances of that looking ahead. Okay, let's go on and look at some of the fo other focus areas. Agriculture, what's going on in the way of agriculture. Uh, again, the, the, the NAS report's coming out this week. So touching on winter wheat um, is the most active thing we have right now because uh, it's broken dormancy in most of the areas. Uh, what's happening in the way of percent headed? Uh, a little bit behind in the Southern Plains area, a little bit ahead in uh, Illinois, Missouri. Um, uh, it's still, still fairly early in that standpoint, and the cooler temperatures recently, um, you know, we've had are somewhat helpful for that. Uh, the winter wheat conditions really are not terrible, given some of the dryness uh, situations that we've had. The recent precipitation out in the central plains has really helped winter wheat in those areas, and the eastern, uh, the eastern winter wheat areas really are pretty good overall. Parts of uh, of North, excuse me, South Dakota and down into Texas, uh, Colorado. I uh, guess uh, Colorado and South Dakota will be the main ones that are in our area, uh, not as good in, in those locations. Uh, some other, and then the winter wheat condition index, uh, this is from Brad Rippey. These are all from Brad Rippey at the uh, at USDA, Office of the Chief Economist. Um, um, this is where the red area is where we are right now not as bad as 2017, uh, coming out of bad drought in 2017, but uh, lower than where we've been uh, for the last five years overall from a, from a winter wheat standpoint. Uh, what's our crop progress on some other crops? Again, very early in the season, main crop activities at this point are small grains, our oats, winter wheat, and sugar beets is not a small grain, but sugar beets being planted. Um, and the, actually the conditions have been quite good for these uh, with the recent relatively cool conditions and very dry compared to many other years, we've made some early planting progress in those areas. Uh, actually, there has been some corn planted. Uh, even 2% of corn has been planted in North Dakota. Again, it's dry conditions, so they're gonna, some people are gonna take advantage of it. We have had reports of other, other folks in North Dakota waiting to put stuff in the ground largely because of, of the dry conditions overall. But the dry conditions generally have been quite good. The only thing limiting uh, additional agriculture activity so far has been the recent cool down and has slowed the warm up of soil temperatures. So a lot of some decent early planting. Uh, the recent cool temperatures have slowed the warming up of soils, so, but generally good conditions. Once we get a little bit of warmth going on again, I think uh, agricultural activity is going to continue very quickly. One little side note from uh, Aaron Wilson at, at Ohio State. Um, the only place really where we get much maple syrup production in our region was, was greatly reduced because the very cold February and then the warm March limited the period of collection. Um, cicadas are going to be something talked about quite frequently around here because of the 17 year cicada coming out. Uh, Kansas, cold issues in February are still manifesting themselves and cattle losses, a third of the counties have reported cattle losses due to the extreme cold in, in that month. 
Uh, we are also dabbling around with some, some freeze issues and some cold issues on some of our specialty crops. Uh, the extreme cold in February did do a little damage to some tree fruits, not widespread, but, but has been some of that. Uh, there have been a couple additional freeze events. We've dabbled with that again just the last couple days. And we have one more possible one coming up uh, into early next week where we have another set of cold temperatures that could uh, dabble with freezing around some of the area. Note that overall, the average last 32 freeze date is, is, you know, is still uh, a ways off. But we have had a combination of, of early phenology um, this is from the National Phenological Network showing the, the comparison of leaf out across the country. We had early leaf out uh, back in, in, in January, early February. The blue area of cold was that cold event in, in February that slowed down. And since then, we've seen rapid, uh, rapid progress towards advanced phenological uh, activity uh, throughout the northern areas. So basically, phenology is speeding up quickly. Uh, we are, uh, you know, that's putting more things at risk of freezing temperatures, even though the freezing temperatures are not that much that anomalous climatologically. We've also had some wildfire issues, some various pictures of, of some wildfire issues from Mary Knapp down in Kansas, the upper left-hand side, the, the Schrader fire uh, in, in uh, Rapid City, uh, just west of Rapid City. Uh, this black area is, is the burn area. And this just to the right of that, the, you can kind of see is, is Rapid City itself. So we had a fire that burned right into the west edge of Rapid City and even damaged uh, parts of some of the developments just out on the west edge of the city. So uh, this has been a fairly common problem throughout all of our states. Some have been minor, some have been more problems. Uh, showed you a picture of the Minnesota ox cart fire, 13,000 acres and $400,000 in structure damage. Um, North Dakota had 300,000 acres burned, 5,000 acres or 5,000 acres burned in Roosevelt National Park, um, uh, a very beautiful area that was there was some damage there. South Dakota, uh, lots of grassland areas. I mentioned some near Black Hills and the southern Black Hills. They closed Mount Rushmore and outside of Keystone, there was damage there. Uh, Kansas has the the again the odd issue that we see in the springtime where we have dry grasses that are burning, but people trying to fight the fires are dealing with wet conditions, a very odd situation. Nebraska did not as major in the way of fires, but did have a small fire that closed by closed I-80 temporarily. And many of these were driven by very warm, very dry conditions, uh, especially the Rapid City one. There was a very strong cold front. We had 50 to 60 mile per hour winds that helped to drive the situation dry air and, and conditions that are still had not greened up and, and very susceptible to these conditions. That's something I forgot to include. I, I apologize to Trent Ford who shared this with me, but we had another conversation about this. We've had some very dry air over our region in several occasions. Um, uh, he, he noted, uh, Trent noted some, some data from Peoria, Illinois, where they had single digit dew points. That's not uncommon in the winter time, but not in April. And, he, and since 1948, he said there's only been a handful of years that we've had single digit dew points in Peoria. And this has occurred on a number of different occasions uh, across the region where we've had very, very dry air. Okay, let's go ahead and get into the, the guts of what we need to talk about here, where we are in the way of outlooks. Uh, we'll touch on La Nina status here and then go through the series of progressions and look at what we've got coming up for us here. Okay, first off, where are we with El Nino, La Nina? And so we don't like our acronyms. El Nino Southern Oscillation is the acronym. Uh, it's a combination to talk about Pacific sea surface temperature conditions. Uh, where we are in March, April, May on the left-hand side, we're at about a 50-50 probability of being in La Nina or neutral conditions by the time we're done with March, April, May. Sea surface temperatures right now are right at the category of being La Nina and could be working their way down. So it looks like we will officially be getting out of La Nina status, if not March, April, May, as we get into the summertime, uh, we, we will definitely get into neutral. Very high likelihood, up to 80% chance in March, May, June, July. Uh, La Nina does appear to research, possibly, um, it is the more it is the more likely condition as we get out into October, November, December, November, December, January. 
we'll have to keep an eye on that. Not a major issue as we're going along. There could be little hints of La Nina hanging around that would impact the summer, but officially uh, we are unlikely to be in La Nina conditions as we go along. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, we might want to mention there that this is a really difficult time of year for ENSO predictions. Uh, April, May, June uh, is a sort of an sort of tough. Uh, we call it a spring barrier for whatever reason. And it's our, and it's really a you know spring barrier to us humans and computers understanding the transition, whatever transition is going to be. Um, we just don't get a firm handle on that until you know sometimes June, but uh, often July and August. So just want to mention that. Right. Correct. And we've also had been having conversations too of, of how much, even if there is a weak La Nina influence around, how much impact could that have on the outlooks as we go along in the summertime? We're not going to belabor that point here, uh, but just letting you know that officially and though from a large scale standpoint, uh, we're likely moving away from, from La Nina or El Nino influence as we go along here. Okay, next seven days in the way of precipitation, this pattern has been hanging out pretty consistently overall. Um, the, you know, we don't have the, the forecast from the Weather Service, but current outlooks for Colorado, Panhandle of Nebraska, and parts of, of, South, of Northeast uh, Colorado are likely to get a decent amount of snowfall over the next couple days. Uh, some winter storm warnings and some winter weather advisories in that area for decent snowfalls. And then that will continue moving to the southeast. It'll turn into more of a rain event where we get, you know, an inch, inch and a half of precipitation will be welcomed through that area. So we look in the Dakotas down through the, the main part of the Corn Belt, very limited precipitation overall, expected in the next seven days, maybe a bit more around the Great Lakes. But we are going to be influenced consistently by cooler Canadian air, cool dry Canadian air, so not a lot of moisture around to be able to produce much in the way of precipitation. So we jump ahead to the 8 to 14 day, look at week two, now we go to our probabilities, temperature on the left hand side, Precipitation on the right-hand side, you're going to see a consistent pattern. Uh, 6 to 10 day, which we don't show here, and 8 to 14 day, both stay on the cool side. 6 to 10 day is very strong. 8 to 14 day is, is decently strong, but weakens a little bit the, the probabilities. It looks like you know largely warmer than average temperatures may have to wait until we get to the end of the month, uh, 1st of May possibly. Overall, the plains area stays drier. The probabilities here are not huge, but they definitely lean towards the dry side throughout a good portion of the rest of the month. Um, the southeastern uh, part of our area, the Ohio Valley on the right-hand side there does have some improved chances for precipitation as we go along towards the end of the month. Uh, good and bad news, some areas, you know, we'd still note it still are dry. Some of the areas are a little wet and additional precipitation wouldn't be a, a great benefit. Jump ahead to May now. Next month, 30-day outlook for May. Um, largely warmer than average, more likely. Southern part of the U.S., northern part of our area, EC equal chances because there are hints of some cooler air hanging around into parts of May. Um, so from a, from a growing season standpoint, small grains and things might not do too badly, um, but uh, southern areas have better chances of being warmer overall, so we should start getting into warming up of soils. Um, precipitation wise, the folks at CPC were noting, um, you know, some, some, some enhanced probabilities for centered on Iowa down to the southeast uh, with better chances there. Uh, most of the dry areas, at least for May, staying mostly south of our area right now. Jump ahead to May through July. You see a pickup now in the warmer than average conditions and that the whole region is warmer than average. More likely the plains have higher probabilities. Great Lakes to Eastern Corn Belt, lesser chances, but still lean towards the warm side. Uh, then the concerning thing is this area of dryness that persists over the plains and actually becomes a bit stronger, especially in the western plains area. Those are some of the dry areas, not good news for them. Still hanging on to some of the wetter than average areas possible to the east. Okay, Seasonal outlooks during the summertime are a bit more difficult, so we have to take these with a grain of salt. But that's what we're looking at right now. Generally, our concerns are more towards the, the plains side less concerned from the Eastern Corn Belt side overall. 
I'll jump ahead one more just to give you the main part of summer here. Um, the again, warmer than average, more likely. And then as the summer goes on, that drier than average area moves northward to the northern plains. Uh, the eastern Corn Belt doesn't, uh, you know, and the outlook doesn't dry out as much, stays in the EC equal chances. So again, plains are more of an area of concern because of hot and dry combinations. Eastern Corn Belt are more of a wait and see. And then given those, something we would expect to see, the drought outlook through the 31st of July, the seasonal drought outlook, um, you know, persistence, maybe development of some drought categories. We'll have to watch that as we go along. Eastern Corn Belt, not as much of a concern at this point. Okay, kind of wrap this up. Um, you know, kind of a split over the region, mostly wetter the south, drier to the north with some regional differences in that. Um, mostly warmer. Uh, we have had several freeze events, have turned colder here recently. That's put a kind of a, a damper on ag activities. Drought issues persist in the Northern Plains, uh, smaller pockets of drought east, uh, limited water, especially from some of the snow areas, real, real problems there. Uh, relatively small wetness issues, even the places that have been somewhat wet generally aren't too bad, uh, com especially compared to some recent years. Fire problems in a lot of areas. Uh, and generally good ag conditions, but the, 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 the cool temperatures have slowed our, our ag activity. So from an outlook standpoint, uh, La Nina should be weakening into the summer where it becomes a marginal, if not non-factor for us. Um, and so the, the El Nino status will be neutral conditions, likely summer into fall and have you know really minor to no impact on the outlooks. And the outlooks again, warmer likely generally, except for far north in May. Um, the, the lighter probabilities in the Midwest, higher probabilities out in the plains. Drier more likely in the plains, especially as we go along during the summer, some, some, some a little better chances for precipitation east. So that leads to likely ongoing status, drought status in the plains, uh, maybe some redevelopment in the central plains and uh, we, something we definitely need to keep an eye on. The thing we have to remember is that precipitation is hard to forecast uh, this far out in, in the season, but if we do end up warmer than average, even decent amounts of precipitation can evaporate, transpire under under increased temperature conditions. And, and, and that's the thing to remember too, even with the cool conditions we have over us right now, relatively dry air, sunshine and wind will continue to dry soil surfaces out, even, even if uh, if we don't get too much precipitation. Just a reminder of where we can get links to some of the information and again where you can get the past recorded precipitation. Past recorded precipitations. How about past recorded presentations instead? Talk like a climatologist, don't I? Okay, and this is just a small subset of the folks who contribute to this on a monthly basis. We do owe these folks and them a great deal of thanks uh, for sharing information on a monthly basis. So, and Here's we are, I got rid of the picture, Doug told me I had to change the picture. So another picture of the Rapid City fire and how close it was compared to Rapid City information about where to find me. Okay, let's do the questions. All right, hey, can you back up just two? To, to, there's always a request to get some of those links off there. Um, okay. Yeah, just leave it there. Uh, before we get into that, the questions and such, and there's not that many, so I think, We'll be able to get through those pretty quickly, but uh, some of the things you said at the end are sort of the concerns um, when we have, uh, and, and Dennis, please expand on these. So the Northern Plains current conditions are pretty darn dry. They have been dry. They've been dry since fall in a lot of places, and we haven't had a lot of recovery. And as you said, luckily, that's not a huge or a high precipitation time of the year. However, um, those are times in which uh, some moisture can get uh, deeper into the soils. We have a comment from North Dakota saying um, holes dug six to eight feet are finding little to no uh, moisture, uh, dry soil six to eight feet deep, which, which is interesting to hear in 2021 because in 2019, maybe not in North Dakota, but certainly a huge amount of the area, uh, we were certainly very, very wet. So Maybe Dennis comment a little bit on the change, and I know we we belabored this over the last few months, but the change from 
the last, let's say, three years, really, in terms of soil moisture and well, reserve and, and, and reserve reserve moisture. Yeah. And, and Doug, hey, we have to go back to 2019. Uh, North Dakota was delayed getting planting last year because soils were wet. There were some carryover crop issues from 2019 into 2020 that slowed things down. But even the start of last year was a problem. So we've had a huge shift from that since then. Um, these started developing last summer and then it continued in the fall and through the winter. And uh, note that I wasn't belittling the, the problem over the winter. It's It's been a definite problem def uh, very much. It's just, you know, if we'd had that kind of extreme precipitation deficit during the summertime, it would be even worse. But yeah, the, the six to eight feet lack of moisture does not surprise me whatsoever. Yeah, so we know the people in those states already know, and um, um, I know they're pro if anybody are from those places are on, they're probably just looking at the outlooks and uh, and hoping and crossing fingers and all that business. So the other thing maybe Dennis address a little bit about typical peak moisture annually for those areas. Do you want to say something about April, May, June? Yeah, yeah. April, May, June are the wettest times um, of the year in the Plains area. Um, you know, May, June, July, June, July, August are, are, are the peak precipitation as you move further east. If you look for the single, if you know, the, the, there's a, if you look at this on an annual basis, there's an increase in precipitation at potential or average precipitation from winter into spring, and then it falls off as you go into the summer. The peak of that uh, in, in that, you know, North Dakota, Western South Dakota area is, mid to third week of May. After that, the precipitation chances start to fall off. So that's why we have real concern is that the, the, the peak chances for precipitation climatologically are coming very close and we don't see that coming along. Eastern parts of the Dakotas and further east, you know, have, have more chances for precipitation as the year goes on. Um, as the growing season goes on, so they have better chances for recovery later on. Um, but, you know, droughts like this don't shift overnight. They don't solve overnight. We need multiple events, and it's it's becoming, they've been teased a few times with some big events around their periphery. We just haven't had a good event over them to at least give them a, a chance to improve. Yeah, I know we have a couple people from Canada on, and I, I'm sorry I didn't look to the north of the border, but um, I do believe that uh, dryness does certainly extend uh, to the north as well. Would make sense, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, someone mentioned, um, someone, uh, Professor William Mitch's uh, wet LA culture work, and I'm not sure what that is. And the question was, is USDA following that work? And I'm not sure if you know who that is. Um, I am not familiar. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that at all. So, so uh, John, I, I, John uh, Porterfield, you made you made the mention of that. Feel free to write to Dennis and ask him more about that via email, since he's the USDA person on the call. Um, okay, does USDA have a tool? Okay, th there's a question about. Um, how, how the advantages of impoundment of 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 water uh, uh, crop pasture for for crop pasture and forest and uh, and all that and um, I I think I answered that fairly well in the answer part I hope um, I did say that impoundments and and NRCS pro programs um, often are geared towards towards uh, holding water back. Um, I think that's a, it's a conservation practice. Dennis, do you want to say anything more about that? The only other one to add to that, there's a research and in, in some experimental work going on where people have done this uh, for the purpose of capturing any nutrients. When you have runoff from your field or through drain tiles, trying to capture the nutrients so they don't go downstream, but then also being able to use that water and the nutrients by reintroducing them sometime during the year. So yeah, NRCS would be the, the USDA entity to work with. Some land grants are doing some work with this also. 
And just to clarify, when you use the, the term average with most of your maps anyway, uh, we're referring to the 30-year average, not the period of record average. Is that correct? Correct. And just a reminder that I think next month we will be able to start using the new 1991 to 2020 averages, if I recall correct, Doug? Yeah. Yes. And that's, and it's a, so, so it's a relative, it's sort of a relative 30 year uh, climatology and it's useful for a lot of comparisons in the short term. Uh, it certainly doesn't give you trend over a century or anything like that, but it, uh, it does allow you to understand how the climate is has changed or uh, what temperatures today compare with uh, the average for the last 30 years, which is important for a lot of uh, decision makers. Um, moving on. Um, okay, any pasture condition evaluation yet? Uh, I didn't get a graphic on pasture and range conditions. Uh, that's a good question. I went looking for the, uh, you know, if you remember last year, we talked about uh, the Northern Plains Climate Hub is working with folks on something called grass cast, trying to use, be able to forecast what grass supply can, forage conditions are going to be based on rangeland and that had not been updated yet. And I don't remember having seen a rangeland condition report yet, but they should have been done. So I apologize. I, I think you're going to see it's going to mimic a lot what you saw in winter wheat. Uh, Northern Plains, not very good. Central Plains, fair to Midland. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, there's a comment that North Dakota spring wheat planting is dusted in, and I'm not sure what that means. Do you want to, you know what that means, Dennis? Um, the, there is a an adage in agriculture, plant in the dust, the bins will bust. Um, <laughs> and there is some semblance of reality to it, but not completely. When you're dealing with very dry conditions, you are dealing with drought. Now, when you're planting in very dry conditions, um, as long as you have enough moisture to get established and you have some rainfall going along, you can do fairly well. Um, the, the crop will, you know, unlike when you plant into very wet conditions, the crop will develop a strong root system trying to find moisture. So if you do have at least some moisture as the year goes along, you can do decently and maybe sometimes do fairly well depending on how it happens. But it is an old adage, so dust it in because the fields are very dusty in the situation. And depending on what their soil management is, they may have very dusty conditions from doing too much tillage. And as a comment about wheat planted in shallow, shallow dry soils is similar to what that may in the yep. context. Um, is the Bermuda high behaving normally? And, I have not, um, I'm not, yeah, go ahead. I say I, I have not looked at the condition of the Bermuda high recently. I, I don't know. Have you looked at that, Doug? Well, I haven't. But one thing that, if you will, the, so a quick explanation of the Bermuda high is uh, a high pressure system at the surface, I do believe, um, that pumps moisture on its backside, which would be from the Gulf of Mexico toward us in the central northern part of. Uh, U.S., etc. Um, we haven't seen that. You know, it, it, you can tell when it's when it's on because, or when the moisture is here. Obviously, when you uh, walk outside in the dew point and you feel feel humidity and all that. Um, there's only been a handful of days so far this year that I uh, I certainly have noticed that, and I'm in Kansas City, so I'm pretty far south already. Um, I don't think we've had that. Uh, uh, all the ingredients, if you will, to uh, to have a sustained advection or movement of moisture from the Gulf to, to, to far to the north. Um, anything you want to say about that, Dennis? Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that the, the, the existence of the Bermuda High is what allows us to have productive agriculture in the central U.S., if not from being able to move that moisture up from the Gulf, we would be a relatively dry location. That's why the Western Plains are more dry because we can't get the moisture there. 
it, where that where that high pressure lines up, if it, if it shifts and and you don't get that flow from the Gulf to the Midwest or get the flow to go to the Southeast U.S. instead of the Midwest, then that can influence it. But I, I have not. I had looked at some other things. I hadn't looked at the position of that this year. So that's a good thing to take note of here. Uh, Dennis, how much does USGS and USDA, to your knowledge, uh, communicate and compare data com uh, relating soil moisture and aquifer conditions? Do you have a, a feel for that, or do we have a graphic or someplace one could see things like that? I, and I'm sure somebody from the USGS and or USDA is gonna comment or may comment here, but I don't know. Yeah, I'd love to have anybody else comment on that. The only thing off the top, most of the times when we're dealing with soil moisture graphics like the one I showed, we're dealing with either near the surface or some level of several feet profile, maybe three or five feet profile. Um, the GRACE maps, uh, I don't remember what GRACE stands for. Those take a little deeper look at what wa water is in the system. So you could look at those. Um, there is sharing of information back and forth. USGS does some of the aquifer monitoring, some states do their own aquifer monitoring. Um, but I, I don't off the top of my head know where I could point you to aquifers where for, of, of deeper level aquifers. Okay, um, yeah, I think that is a, I think state by state sort of issued to some degree. Uh, you mentioned 30 year increments are important. Where are the 30 year where are the 30 year increments of information kept if not recent archive wise so those are kept all that information is kept at if you will my home office in Asheville North Carolina they're the ones that do all the calculations and put out all the averages and normals for the 30 years um, they will they do keep past 30 year averages so you can see the differences um, that's one of the things we're very interested in showing people um, how for the most part, for the most part, not everywhere, but for the most part, how conditions have warmed when you move a 10-year increment, 10 years into the future every uh, 10 years, actually, uh, over that 30-year span. So, uh, Laura, we can talk more about that. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can write me an email and I can send it to you, I suppose, or try to get the answer to that. Um, uh, Danelle says, Danelle, who is uh, Dennis's counterpart in the High Plains uh, with USDA, said the um, <clears throat> grass cast information, and you can type grass cast into Google and find out more about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're going to be posting their first maps for 2021 soon. And that, that is a prediction based upon uh, whether conditions are going to be wet, uh, sort of in between, near normal or above normal. Um, those, that's, that's what those, those maps will show you. And it's pretty much high plains to sort of central, north, south, uh, Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, um, and maybe they, southern they are, plains. They are expanding a little bit this year. And there is a component of those based on conditions coming in because grasslands have, for lack of a better word, a memory to them. If they if you had a bad year last year, uh, unless you get at least near average to above average precipitation, rangeland doesn't recover as well. So there's an incorporation of the, the rangeland condition in addition to expected precipitation. All right, the final question I have, Dennis, is will the yield of corn planted now in the areas of severe drought be impacted? I think I, think I could just say yes, but I, I'd like to hear it from a professional. <laughs> well, I'll make you feel good and say yes, too. <laughs> um, but but again, that gets back to what are the ongoing conditions. Even if you have below average rainfall going along, if you have rainfall timed appropriately and you have a crop that has a good root system to be able to extract moisture available, um, it can it can survive and, and do okay. Um, but from you know what you heard, you know, the comment about six to eight feet of of, of lack of moisture and some of those dry conditions up there, we really need a lot to happen to be able to have that do well. So uh, it, it, it's, we're probably going to take some sort of a yield reduction up there. But do we you want to mention, yeah, 
Do you want to mention anything about the timing of rainfall and all that kind of business, how important that is, especially for wheat and things like that? Uh, wheat doesn't quite have the same, wheat and soybeans don't quite have the same critical time as, as corn does. Uh, you can do a lot to corn until it reaches tasseling, but if you get it through the, the tasseling reproductive period with a decent amount of rainfall with limited stress, you can still do okay. Uh, and then there are some periods in, in grain fill after that. Um, there are various issues with, with soybeans <laughs> later in the year, wheat earlier in the year, but they don't have that quite the same critical time period where you can greatly influence what's going on. Okay. That's pretty much it. Um, thank you all for tuning in. We'll do this again with Aaron Wilson from The Ohio State uh, in about a month, on the 20th to be specific. So we'll see you then. Fill out your surveys. You. <laughs> Fill out a survey if you get one, please. Thank you, Dennis, for, uh, for all of that. Appreciate it.